especially in Paul's letter to the Galatians, the third chapter, reading from the 23rd verse, right through to the end of chapter 3, and then moving into chapter 4. Uh, let us read God's word together, Galatians chapter 3, and at verse 23. Now before faith came, that's to say before we had been converted to Christ, we Christians were confined under the law, that's to say under the moral law of God. Uh, Paul introduces us to two worlds here, first of all the world of law, and those who are under law, and then the word of faith, and those who belong to the world of faith. Now before faith came, we Christians were confined under the moral law. We were kept under restraint, because that's the purpose of the moral law, is to keep men under restraint, until faith should be revealed. So that the moral law of God was our custodian, or our guardian, until Christ came, in order that we, when Christ came, might be justified by faith, or pronounced righteous by faith, because that's the meaning of justification, to be given a new status in the sight of God, a status of righteousness, a standing of righteousness by faith. But now that faith in Christ has come, we Christians are no longer under a custodian. For in Christ Jesus, and here's the new dimension, you are all the sons of God or the children of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek in this family. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, if you do belong to the family of God, then, miraculously, you are Abraham's offspring, because Abraham is the father of the faithful. You are Abraham's offspring, and you are heirs according to the promise made to Abraham 2,000 years before Christ was born. And that was the promise that in Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth should be blessed. Abraham's seed, seed there is singular. Abraham's seed is Christ. And so 2,000 years before Christ, God promised to Abraham that in his seed, Christ, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Verse 29, And so if you are Christ's, if you belong to Christ, and you're in God's family, then you are Abraham's offspring, and you are heirs according to the promise. What I mean is this, says Paul in chapter 4, that the heir, as long as he is a child or is a junior, is no better than a slave, although he is the owner of all the estate. Now here again you have two worlds, the world of slavery and the world of sonship. What does it mean to be a slave? What does it mean to be a son or a child of God? I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no better than a slave, although he is the owner of all the estate. But he is under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. And so with us, when we were children, we were slaves. 
to the elemental spirits, the demonic spirits of the universe. But when the time had fully come, or when the fullness of the time had come, or when the time was ripe, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman and born under the law, to redeem or to buy back those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And so through God, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are an heir. Um, I want to speak this evening about the call of God uh, to us to be the adopted children of God. Um, the general series uh, of these meetings is concerned with the call of God. Last night we were concerned with the call of God to us to bow the knee to the Lordship of Christ. And I want to speak this evening about the call of God to us to be the adopted sons and daughters of God. And so we concentrate our thinking on uh, chapter 4 and uh, verse 4 where Paul says that when the time had fully come God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons and the thing to do with this fourth verse is to take the opening and the closing phrases. When the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son so that we might receive adoption as sons. When the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son in order that we might receive adoption as sons. And there is a new slant to the message of the gospel. When we are asked the question, why did Christ come into the world? Uh, we normally say, well, Christ came into the world to die for us. Christ came into the world to give his life for us. Christ came into the world to deliver us. Christ came to die to save us. And what we normally stress in these answers is the saving work of Christ. Uh, all the things that have to do with the salvation that has come to us in the coming and the death and the rising of Christ. Christ came to save. Christ came to deliver us. Christ came to die and to rise and so on. But according to Paul here in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, God sent forth his Son into the world that we might become the adopted children of God. When the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son in order that we might become the adopted sons and daughters of God. As is often said in Christian circles, Christ was born into our family, the human family, in order that we might be born into God's family. The Son of God became a Son of Man in order that the sons of men might become the sons of God. The Son of God became a Son of Man in order that the sons of men might become the sons of God. 
Now, let me say just um, one or two words of introduction uh, to the things that lie behind this verse. God sent forth his Son when the time was ripe that we might receive adoption. Uh, you may recall that yesterday evening we were thinking of how uh, after Paul had preached in Colossae, a new group of men came in with another message and another gospel. And uh, what happened in Colossae also happened in Galatia. Uh, if you turn back to uh, chapter 1 of Galatians, you'll see there Paul speaking about a different gospel. Because what happened in uh, Colossae also happened in Galatia. In uh, chapter 1 of Galatians and at verse 6, uh, Paul says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who has called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Now you'll notice that he calls this new message a different gospel. Not the old gospel made relevant and contemporary. Not Jesus Christ dressed up in contemporary clothes, but a completely different message. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we first said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you received, let him be accursed or excommunicated. And what had happened was this. No sooner had Paul established a work of grace in Galatia, and no sooner had men and women been won to Christ by the message of grace, than new men came into the church with this newfangled message. And the new message in Galatia can be summed up very simply. It was Jesus plus. In this case, it was Jesus plus Moses. It was Jesus plus the law. It was Jesus plus. Let me ask you, what happens when you add to perfection? You subtract from it. If you go to Paris, you can visit the Louvre and you'll see the Mona Lisa with her unusual smile. It's generally considered a perfect painting. What would happen to the painting if you took out a brush and some paints and said, you know, I think there are one or two mistakes in this painting. I think I would like to touch it up a little. <laughs> you would not have added to perfection. You would have subtracted from it. And when you add to Christ, and when you start to propagate a gospel of Jesus plus, Jesus plus vegetarianism, or Jesus plus yoga, or Jesus plus certain shibboleths, certain prohibitions, certain things you mustn't do, you mustn't touch, you mustn't taste, Jesus plus, you do not add to Jesus Christ, you detract from Jesus Christ. The message of the gospel is Jesus only. 
grace only, faith only. And along came these men, they are called the legalizers. And they said, it's too simplistic, it's too simple, it's too naive. Jesus only is not enough. You must have Jesus plus, plus Moses, plus the law, plus Jewish observances, plus shibboleths, plus prohibitions. Jesus plus. And they detracted from Christ and they led the Christians in Galatia from Christ back to Moses and from the world of grace back to the world of law and from the freedom of sonship to the bondage of slavery. And that's why the letter to the Galatians has as its main theme the theme of Christian freedom. A Christian is somebody who is a free man. He has been delivered by Jesus Christ and is no longer under a yoke of bondage. See how strongly Paul puts it later on in Galatians chapter 4. Turn to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 22. Now this is rather a difficult passage to follow because it is an allegory or a parable. The thing to understand here is that Abraham had two sons. The first son, Ishmael, was born of a slave woman. The second son, Isaac, was born of a free woman. And so the slave woman and the free woman stand for two ways of life slavery or freedom a world of bondage or a world of deliverance look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse 22 for it is written in the book of Genesis that Abraham had two sons one by a slave who was called Hagar and she's not just a woman, she's a complete way of life. And one by a free woman who is Sarah, who again is not just a woman, she's a complete way of life. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh. You remember Abraham couldn't wait for a son, although God had promised him a son. He was getting on in years Sarah was getting on in years and past childbearing and Abraham thought that well maybe God had made a mistake so perhaps God needed a little helping hand and then there was the affair with Hagar and then the child Ishmael was born Ishmael became the father of the Arabs and the Arabs have been the curse of God's people to this very day why do you think there is conflict in the Middle East today? Why do you think Arabs and Jews are at each other's throats? And why do you think the kingdoms of the Arabs are in total chaos? See how the Arabs hate each other. Why? Because Abraham thought that God needed a helping hand. And so in a fleshly spirit, Ishmael was born. What a disaster that was. Do you think God needs helping hands from us? I know we must work with God, but we must work with God in the spirit, not in the flesh. Verse 23. The son of the slave was born according to the flesh. That's a way of life. And the son of the free woman, Sarah, was born through promise because Isaac was a child of promise. Now says Paul in verse 24. This is very difficult to understand. Let's see if we can stretch our intelligences. This is an allegory, a parable. These women stand for two covenants. 
a covenant of law that brings bondage and a covenant of grace that brings freedom a covenant of law that has to do with slaves a covenant of grace that has to do with sons and daughters this is an allegory these two women are two covenants one is from Mount Sinai that's the way of the law bearing children for slavery that's a complete way of life people who are outside Christ are slaves and she is Hagar now Hagar is or stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and she corresponds to the present Jerusalem that's the Jews who hadn't yet come to Christ the present Jerusalem for she is in slavery with her children but the Jerusalem above the world of grace is free and she is our mother for it is written in Isaiah chapter 54 rejoice O barren one who does not bear break forth and shout you who are not in travail that's Sarah for the children of the desolate that's Sarah are more than the children of her that is married now we brothers like Isaac are the children of promise if you're a Christian you're a child of promise but just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh that's Ishmael persecuted him who was born according to the spirit that's Isaac the world of flesh fighting against the world of, of spirit and the world of slavery fighting against the world of grace and of freedom and of sonship just as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit so it is now I could I could keep you here till midnight telling of godly men in Scotland today whose hearts are broken by the conflict in their congregations that are hearing the gospel for the first time in 150 years some of these churches where dead worldly carnal church people have been ensconced for generations in their worldliness and their unbelief God is challenging them and the world of flesh is fighting against the world of the spirit terrible thing I know ministers in Scotland young men whose lives are desolated by the battles that are going on the battles of the gospel Ishmael fighting Isaac the world of law fighting the world of grace the world of slavery fighting the world of freedom the world of bondage fighting the world of sonship verse 29 as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit so it is now but what does the scripture say cast out the slave and her son for the son of the slave shall not inherit with the son of the free woman and so brothers we Christians are not the children of the slave but the children of the free woman chapter 5 it is for freedom that Christ has set us free stand fast therefore and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery verse 13 for you were called to freedom brothers now that is the background to Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4 when the fullness of the time had come God sent forth his son in order that we might receive adoption as sons now I want to speak this evening 
about three kinds of ripeness, about two kinds of time, and about two kinds of world. And I want you to see how all of these reach their climax in the idea of sonship, our adoption to be God's children. First of all, then, three kinds of ripeness, or as the authorized version has it here in verse 4, eh, fullness. When the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son. The fullness of the time had come. Three kinds of fullness. Now, of course, every Christian knows that when Jesus was born at Bethlehem, that was not an accidental thing. That was not a fortuitous thing. Uh, Christ just didn't happen at Bethlehem uh, like that. The incarnation uh, didn't just uh, fall out of the sky. It had been planned for by God for countless ages Uh, The late uh, Professor C.S. Lewis uh, calls the birth of Christ the divine invasion. God invading our world and coming into our humanity and our time and our history. God had invaded his universe in the coming of Christ. And all that was needed for the invasion was ripeness or fullness, a strategic moment, the right time for God to come. It would have been quite wrong, for example, for Christ to have been born a hundred years earlier than he was. The time was not ripe then. It would have been wrong for Christ to have been born a hundred years later. The time was not ripe. When the time was ripe, Christ was born. And there were, in fact, three kinds of ripeness when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Uh, First of all, of course, there was uh, geographical ripeness. Uh, The world had never been so united as it was when Jesus was born. You could travel from the middle of Scotland to India without a passport or a visa because the whole thing was the Roman Empire. Nowadays, if you want to travel from, say, America across to India and you want to go overland, Think of the countless visas you would need to get through communist countries and Islamic countries, Turkey, Persia, Iran. How many visas would you need? But this was the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire had straddled the known world with a magnificent spider's web of roads. And these roads united the world. The world was never so one as when Jesus was born. And the time was geographically ripe for the coming of the evangel. Secondly, the time was morally ripe for the coming of a savior. You only need to read through some of the literature of that later Greek period to see the awful uh, despair that had gripped men's hearts uh, morally, the, the darkness and the disillusionment and the disenchantment in men's minds. The great strategic cities of the Roman Empire were often sinks of iniquity. The city of Corinth was famed for its wickedness. In fact, it was such a wicked city, they had to invent a new verb to describe the wickedness of the city. And the verb was to Corinthianize. 
And to Corinthianize meant to live it up like the Corinthians. The place was a sink of iniquity. The city of Ephesus was a monumental center for prostitution where the great goddess Diana was worshipped, the great sex goddess of the ancient world. And of course, one of the seven wonders of the world stood there. It was the great temple of this sex goddess Diana. And her temple was a magnet for all the criminals of the empire. It was a world of moral despair. It was a world of moral hopelessness. It was a world that was bankrupt. And the world was ripe, morally ripe, for the coming of a savior. One of the Greek dramatists said, Call no man happy until he be dead. And that was the world into which Christ was born. It is a good thing to die, said a Greek writer, but the best thing of all is not to have been born. The best thing of all is not to have been born. It is a world of darkness, and the world was morally ripe for the coming of Christ. Thirdly, the world was spiritually ripe for the coming of a savior. Uh, the old religions were dying. Uh, nowadays we hear of people describing themselves as atheists. Atheism is not a new thing. The word atheist is a Greek word and it comes from this world. An atheist is someone who says that there is no God. And it was the Greeks who said there was no God. The word skepticism comes from Greece. The word cynicism comes from Greece. The old gods and the old religions had failed. If you read Schaeffer's great book, How Shall We Then Live? Schaeffer says that in fact the great empires failed because their gods were too small. The gods of Greece and the gods of Rome couldn't solve the heartaches and the problems of their generation. The gods had failed and the world was ripe for the coming of a savior. And so when Christ was born, there was a remnant in Israel waiting for that savior. And how small a remnant it was. Elizabeth and Zechariah, the parents of John the Baptist, Anna and Simeon, waiting in the temple for the consolation of Israel, Joseph and Mary, the royal house of David, now reduced in might, waiting for the coming of a savior. Geographically, morally, spiritually, the world was ripe for the coming of Christ. And I believe that these three kinds of ripeness geographical ripeness, moral ripeness, and spiritual ripeness are found in the heart of every seeking soul. For anyone who truly seeks the Lord, there comes a moment when these three ripenesses come together. And when these three ripenesses come together for that seeking soul that is the moment of salvation when Christ comes when the time is ripe God sends forth his son when you are in the right place geographically when you are in the right state morally when you are in the right condition Spiritually, God sends forth his Son. Three kinds of fullness. And when the three kinds of fullness meet, God sends forth his Son. Secondly, two kinds of time. It's a, a tantalizing thing that uh, in the English language, 
we only have one word for time. But the Greeks had two words for time. The one word was the word chronos. And chronos time is chronological time. That is chronos time. It's the time that ticks, ticks, ticks away your life, years, months, days, minutes, seconds. Chronological time relentlessly marching on. Chronological time gobbling up the months and the years and the days. But the Greeks had another word for time. And it was the word kairos. And kairos means the fitting time. The opportune time. The right time. Salvation time. The hour of destiny. The hour when eternity touches your life. Uh, Isaiah puts it like this. In an acceptable time, I will hear you in a day of salvation. In an acceptable time, I will hear you. When the time is ripe, destiny time, salvation time, I will hear you. In Isaiah 61, the verses quoted by Christ in his first sermon at Nazareth, He said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord. The right time, the right time, the day of salvation. In Isaiah 55, Isaiah says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Now that's salvation time. That is destiny time when the time is ripe. Seek ye the Lord while while he may be found. In fact, the Hebrew says, Seek ye the Lord while he allows himself to be found. And the implication is that there is a time for seeking God. And if you miss the time, you miss God. There is a time to be saved. There is a time to be consecrated. There is a time to be sanctified. Seek ye the Lord while he allows himself to be found. Destiny time. It's an idea that's found very much in Christ's teaching. In John's Gospel, for example, Christ says time and time again, Mine hour has not yet come. My time has not yet come. In John's Gospel, chapter 2, for example, Um, And we're thinking of the hour of destiny, the accepted time, the ripe time, in John's Gospel, chapter 2, the story of the wedding in Cana of Galilee. On the third day, there was a marriage at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the marriage with his disciples. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, O woman, What have you to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Now that's destiny time. You find it also in chapter 7 at verses 6 and 8. Well, reading in from verse 1, After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of the tabernacles was at hand. And so his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples down south may see the works that you are doing. For no man works in secret if he seeks to be known proper openly. If you do these things, show yourself in the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come. And that's destiny time. But your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Go to the feast yourselves. I am not going up to this feast, for 
My time has not yet fully come. The hour of destiny. Later on in chapter 8 and verse 20. <clears throat> reading in from verse 19. They said to him therefore, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. The ripe time. And in John chapter 17, the Lord's Prayer, the real Lord's Prayer, the prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, is really the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer is the high priestly prayer of Christ in John 17. And how does it start? When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, and I think this is the last time he says it, Father, the hour has come. Time is ripe now. Kairos time, not chronological time, not this time ticking away our years, and minutes and lives but God's time we sing about it in the most familiar of all our Christmas carols still the night holy the night love is smiling from thy face strikes for us now the hour of grace strike for us now the hour of grace. The hour of grace is God's time. Tomorrow's no good. Tomorrow God may not call you. God's right time is now. There are two kinds of time. Chronological time and God's time. And God's time is now. If you're going to be saved, you must be saved now. If you're going to be born again, you must be born again now. If you're going to consecrate your life to Christ, you must consecrate your life to Christ now. Because this is God's time. When the time was ripe, says Paul, God sent forth his Son that we might receive adoption as sons. Three kinds of ripeness, two kinds of time, and two kinds of world. The first is the world of law. It is characterized by works. And the key word is slaves. The second is the world of grace. It's characterized by faith. And its key words are sons and heirs. Look at Galatians chapter 3 again. And verse 23, and see these two worlds standing out. Before faith came, you see, we're not all born with faith. There's, there's a sort of vague, woolly, muddled, cotton woolly sort of idea that all men have faith. But the Bible says that all men don't have faith. Before faith came, we Christians were confined under the moral law. And we were kept there under restraint until faith should be revealed. The world of law, the world of faith. So that the law was our custodian and our guardian until Christ should come in order that we should be pronounced righteous by faith, not by works. But now that faith has come, we're living in a different world. We Christians are no longer under a custodian. For in Christ Jesus, and here's the new world, and here's the new dimension, you are all children of God through faith. 
Which world are you living in tonight? Are you in the world of works? Or are you in the world of faith? Are you a slave? Or are you a child of God? You see, the climax of all of this is our adoption into God's family. God sent his Son into the world in order that we might be adopted as sons. I don't want to baffle you with numbers, but there are two kinds of sonship. There is general sonship, and there is particular sonship. Now, general sonship is true of all men. By virtue of creation, God is the Father of all men in a general sort of way. That's what Paul says in Acts chapter 17. He's preaching to the pagans on Mars Hill in Athens. And he says to that pagan congregation, We also are God's offspring. Because God made us. Of course, the Victorians made a great deal of this, didn't they? And they built their entire watered-down gospel on this. If you had lived a hundred years ago, you would have heard preachers going on about the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. God is not the father of all men. And all men are not brothers. People who are in Christ are brothers and sisters. People who are in Christ have God as their father. But the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man is a false message. It's a false gospel. Because God is men's father only in a general way. To all those who live inside the world of grace, God sent forth his son in order that we might be adopted as the children of God. Now the Greek word is the word tekna. And its real translation, and you'll have to learn to speak Scots, is bairns. You speak about bairns in America? Maybe not. A pretty little child in Scotland is a bonny wee bairn. And bairn is an old, old word, and it means a born one. People who are in Christ... And people who have been adopted into God's family are the born ones of God. They're born twice. Of course, they still belong to the human family. We've all been born once. You don't cease to be born once just because you've been born twice. What does Billy Graham say? Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. But that's the way into the family of God. That's the way to become one of God's tekna, his born ones and his children. And Christ came into the world that we might be adopted into God's family and transferred from the genealogy of the first Adam into the genealogy of the second Adam transferred given new brothers and new sisters and a new father a new destination and a new life sonship the way in is the new birth the time is going but let's just look for a second at the new birth in John chapter 3 the time has gone I'm sorry John 3 there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus why did he come to Jesus by night well <laughs> some people think he, he was a bit ashamed to be seen with Christ you know during the day you know, he didn't want to be associated with the Galilean mob. So he came in the darkness. 
Uh, I don't think that's true. He was a man of integrity. The Gospels portray Nicodemus as a man of integrity. He was there when Jesus died. He came to Jesus by night because he knew that Jesus was a busy man, a rabbi. It was the only time of day he could get Jesus alone. And it was because he respected Christ that he came in the darkness when the crowds had gone and things were quiet. He respected the rabbi, wanted to hear what the rabbi had to say. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. The Pharisees weren't all hypocrites. There were good Pharisees. A ruler of the Jews. He was a high hedion in the kirk, we would say in Scotland. One of the leaders. A high hedion in the kirk. This man came to Jesus by night. I'm suggesting he respected Jesus. Not that that's enough, of course. You can respect Jesus and go to hell. Millions respect Christ and they'll be in hell. said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He spoke truly. He honored Christ. Jesus answered him but by passing this rather specious introduction. By passing the compliments. Truly, Truly, the Greek is Amen, by the way. Amen, Amen, which is Hebrew for so let it be. It, it comes from the Hebrew Oman, which means to be like a rock. And when you sing, which you don't, Amens at the end of the hymns, it means so let it be. That is rock. That's when you sing Amen. That is rock. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless one is born anew, it has a double meaning, it can mean to be born twice, or it can mean to be born from above, anothen, to be born from on high, to be a child of heaven, not a child of earth. If you know anything about Jews, you'll know that when a Jewish child is circumcised, they put the child into the arms of an old man. And the old man sits in a chair and lifts his feet off the ground. And the rabbi circumcises the child while he's off the ground, and the old man's off the ground sitting on the chair. And it's a sign that that child is now an heir of heaven. It doesn't belong to this world. It's a heavenly child with a heavenly destiny and a heavenly future. Now that's what it means to be born twice. To be born from above. You're now a child of heaven. Jesus answered him, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born twice or from heaven, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, a bit puzzled, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless one is born of water, that's natural birth, and the spirit, that's heavenly birth, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. There are only two sorts of men. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born anew. Listen to the wind. They were, they were sitting on the rooftop. It was the cool of the day, and the wind was blowing through the trees. Jesus said, listen to the wind, Nicodemus. The wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but you don't know where it comes or whether it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Now look at this verse. It's one of the key verses. 
Jesus said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet do not understand this? You see, Nicodemus ought to have known that he needed to be born again. Because this is found in the Old Testament. Did you know that every basic Christian doctrine is found in the Old Testament? The forgiveness of sins, the second coming of Christ, the last judgment, heaven and hell, the resurrection of the dead, Satan, his fall and his downfall, and the need to be born again. Did you know that every basic Christian doctrine is found in the Old Testament? Listen to these words from Ezekiel 11. Here's the new birth. I will give them a new heart. That's what it means to, to be a child of God. And I will put a new spirit within them. I will take the stony heart of flesh and I will give them a heart. Get for yourselves, Ezekiel chapter 18, get for yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die? Ezekiel 36. A new heart will I give you. That's what it is to be a child of God. That's what it is to be adopted into God's family and transferred from the family of Adam into the family of the second Adam and the last Adam. A new heart will I give you. A new spirit I will put within you. I will take out of you the heart of stone and I will give you a heart of flesh. Lastly, in 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, the moral implications of it, I wish there were time, there isn't time. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him. I see some of you young people without Bibles. You'll never understand my messages if you don't bring the scriptures with you. These meetings are expositions of scripture. I'm not preaching sermons on texts. I'm not preaching sermons on topics. We are searching the scriptures to find out the truth of God. And therefore, these meetings will be very, very dull if you don't bring the scriptures and search the scriptures. So if you're going to come back, bring your Bibles with you. First John 2 and verse 28. Now little children, abide in him. Stay in the family. So that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who does right, and that means evangelical righteousness, which is not the same as morality. Morality is only a bit of evangelical righteousness. Evangelical righteousness is bigger than mere morality. Being good doesn't save you. Being evangelically righteous saves you. Everyone who does evangelical righteousness is born of him. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are the techna, the born ones of God. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. He was the child of God too, remember. Beloved, we are God's bairns now. We are now God's born ones. It does not yet appear 
what we shall be when he comes and we're changed. But we do know this, that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, if you're a child of God, how should you live? What are the moral implications of adoption? Well, here they are in verse 3. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. I was told yesterday by a gentleman that I had not received the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I asked him what assurance he could give me that I had not received the fullness of the Spirit and he said because I could not speak in tongues. I asked him if he could give me one verse from Scripture by which he could convince me that speaking in tongues was an infallible sign of receiving the Spirit and of course he couldn't. I said to him the only infallible sign that you have received the Holy Ghost is that your life has been changed. Do you have the character of Christ in you? Do you have the lineaments and the outlines of the character of Jesus Christ in you? Do you have the fruits of the Spirit in your character, in your heart, in your conscience, in your life? That's the test. Everyone who thus hopes as a child of God purifies himself just as Christ is pure. May God give us grace so to live and so to do and so to be. In number 250, Arise, my soul, arise, shake off thy guilty fears. The bleeding sacrifice in my behalf appears. Hymn number 250.